Well, I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. For the sake of time, we'll be reading just the first nine verses, but I do intend to cover all of three at the beginning of four. The word of the living God, dear church. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Did you hear that, children? Disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Let's pray. Lord, we would be completely foolish and silly to think that we could do this portion of our worship apart from your help, apart from your spirit. Lord, if your spirit does not come and carry the preaching of your word, if your spirit does not anoint the preaching of your word, if your spirit is not the one ultimately grabbing your word and placing it deep down within the hearts of the people, then this is nothing more than just conversation. But if your spirit does this and we plead and ask that it would, then this is life changing, life sustaining, life invigorating truth for the soul on which we feast upon Christ himself so we beg and we ask for help in Christ's name amen well when there is times of difficulty like we just saw in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 when there's times that are beginning to come onto the scene as it were when you know just by holding a certain worldview there's going to be difficulty there's going to be opposition just by being perhaps the one spouse who's actually a Christian in your household there's going to come tension there's going to come a uh, uh, problems in the world in the home wherever it is in times of difficulty, one of the hardest things for us as a people, whether that's from the pulpit, whether that's in your homes, whatever it may be, one of the hardest things to actually continue to, to cling to is, is the word of Christ sufficient? Is the word of Christ going to be enough? Is the word of Christ where we'll turn to, to truly be helped, to truly maintain a biblical worldview? Because our flesh wants to turn to self-help. Our flesh wants to turn to worldly wisdom. Our flesh wants to do that which is easiest rather than going and laboring and sticking your nose in this until you find help. Rather than sticking to this and, and being perhaps abandoned by all like Paul. Maybe we turn to what gratifies the flesh so we'll be liked. Church, we, I think, are about to embark on a new kind of world as it were in christianity we're about to in a real sense be in a position where we have to be very very wise and astute and 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 just have shrewdness about us to be able to differentiate between the different types of preachers and pastors and churches that are out there this whole section, that's why I'm covering it in one, is really just at the heart of it, those who have the appearance of godliness. Did you see, Paul listed a bunch of sins. He left nothing unturned. He addressed everyone. And yet he says they have the appearance of godliness. How can that be? Because there is such a group of individuals that they can masquerade themselves in such a way where they seem, well, they have a good life. They keep it together. Paul is talking about at the heart of these men, there is a lack of desire, a lack of trust, a lack of real uh, a commitment to the word of God. So you either have licentiousness because of there's, 
because there's no word or there's this middle ground that appears to be a, 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 a godly, but they lack the word. And as Paul said, they'll be found out. And what I think, well, I'll get to in a second, is the last group. So church, on the one hand, Yes, we know the theological liberals that question everything about the Bible. They don't really use it. They, they, they really are living against it, yet they occupy pulpits, yet they do things in the name of God. Yes, we know that, that that group is the easy group to do away with. The theological liberals, no one's getting swept away by them. I pray. Now, there's another group that would be more of the, they use the word from time to time. They know how to pull verses to help their sermon, not let the verses be the purpose of their sermon, but they just find what they want to say and they find Bible verses to back that up. That's that second group. And I'm convinced that most of us can discern what that is. But there's a third group. And this third group, in my opinion, is one of the most dangerous because in this third group, there's actually solid men. There's solid churches. But they say things like, all we do here is just stick to the gospel. All we do here is just preach the gospel. And I say that stuff. So you're thinking, well, you say that. But I say the gospel impacts all of life. These people truncate the gospel. They, they, they reduce it to not impacting anything except the soul. And all we're concerned about is souls getting to heaven. Souls getting to heaven. Well, what about the entire process until we get to heaven? And that's where we have to be very wise, very careful. That's where I think that there is a new, uh, maybe not new, but a, a, a continually emerging faithful biblical group that just cries the Reformation cry that says sola scriptura and tota scriptura, meaning all of the scriptures, not picking and choosing, all of them for all of life. One of my favorite theologians said, the reformers and their heirs unleash the power of the gospel into their context. And they truly believed no part of culture was left untouched. Church, someone is going to impact culture. Someone is going to be a voice to impact culture. The more that Christians think, well, that's not our world. That's their kingdom. And we just pull out and we do our little stuff here the more you'll see culture continue to go a certain way. No, we must know that the word of God impacts all of life. And this word of God, if you can envision it in your head, is kind of like a foundation where Christ shines from. This is where we get Christ. This is what tells us about Christ. This is where we have our foundation led for us so we could feast upon Christ at the end of the day. I just want to say with Abraham Kuyper, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. That is what is going on, in my opinion, in this realm, where Timothy is going to be faced with, with the reality, is the word of God sufficient, Timothy? Is it sufficient? Do you think it's able to do what it was designed to do? Or Timothy, will you resort to light shows? to fog machines? We resort to coming down a zip line to entertain God's people. Are you con convinced in your mind? Are you settled in your entire being, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ? Are you convinced, Timothy, that the word of God is able to do what it was designed to do? Church, I'm asking you, are you convinced of that? In your life, in your home life, in your private life, where do you find your wisdom? Where do you go to find help? Where do you go to settle matters of differences with family or with colleagues or with coworkers? Where, what is your standard? Church, may all of us say the word of God and the word of God alone. So, as I stated, difficult days are coming. But look at verse 1 here. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. This last days, is it something 2,000 or so years departed from Paul's writing? Is Paul telling Timothy, hey, a little, a little secret about the end times, Timothy? It's going to be like this. And Timothy thinks, well, let me just turn over because that doesn't apply to me. No, Paul is talking to Timothy. In these last days, he's talking about the short term, the near term. He's not talking about thousands of years off. He's talking about what is coming your way, Timothy. All these individuals that I, I just read from, all these people that have the appearance of, of, of godliness, but deny the power. And he tells Timothy to avoid such people. Now notice, he's not saying avoid unbelievers. No, we are called to be light in darkness. We don't uh, 
avoid unbelievers. He's talking about those who use the name of Christ, who use the scriptures, who use uh, perceivable good things to try to gain something, mostly money or power or fame. He's saying avoid those type of people. Those who are peddling the word of God. Those who are prostituting the word of God. Those who are using God and God's name in such a way to just gain selfish desires for themselves. That's why he says they're lovers of pleasure. They're swollen with conceit. They're rather, uh, they're, they're, they rather uh, chase what they desire rather than the love of God. And they even go in verse 6, are creeping into household and capturing weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. These men are just on a rampage. And sure, maybe some of the big megachurch guys aren't going into women's homes and trying to win them over. But they're doing that by saying, give to us, give to us, donate to us, support us. They're still going in those homes and ravaging those homes, as it were. And here we see verse 8 and 9. But just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. What is he getting at here? Well, this is actually quoting an, a, uh, a narrative from Exodus. Now, if you remember the story of Exodus, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and they perform things that would show God is on our side. God is with us. Listen to this in Exodus chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. So they're doing what God had commanded it, and, and, and God is proving himself, saying, These are my guys. Look what they're able to do. Verse 11, then Pharaoh summoned the, the, the wise men who were the two men of our, of our chapter and the sorcerers and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But angel's staff swallowed up their staffs. Don't miss that part. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Why is Paul calling this, this, this to mind? Because there's individuals out there who can match a form of godliness, a form of power. Well, look at how, how, how big his church is. Look how, mo how motivational he is. You're getting 50 views on YouTube. They're getting 50 million views on YouTube. They're the ones that got it. You guys are the nobodies. Church, all of that will be swallowed up by the work of Christ in his church. All of that will one day come to folly. All of that one day will be footstooled and it'll be exposed for what it is. You continue to see time and time again, all these guys fall and fall and fall and their true colors come out. Why? Because those who, who, who survive and last the test of time, they are trusting themselves to Christ. We be patient. They don't have the gift of patience. <laughs> they don't have the, that, that fruit of the Spirit. If we're patient... They'll show their true colors. And so he calls these to mind to say, hey, even look at Moses' day. There was two guys, two magicians that had the form of power, the form of godliness, and they were proven to be false. So be wise, Timothy. Don't lay hands on any man too hastily, Timothy. Don't encourage anyone too quick in, in, in their salvation, Timothy. See what's going on. Actually have a sense of wittiness, have a sense of discernment about you to be able to really test the spirits, Timothy. And he goes on, verses 10 through 13. And he's going to, Paul's going to seem like he's switching completely angles here. He's not. He's not. He says, you, however. So in comparison to these false teachers, Paul is telling Timothy, you, Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescue me, rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and themselves being deceived. So Paul is saying, you've seen what I've gone through, Timothy. I was persecuted. I was in a sense stoned and beaten and thrown in prisons. If I would have 
fallen, if I would have been a phony, if I would have been an imposter, it would have been revealed when, when difficult times comes. Church, nine times out of ten, when difficult, difficulty comes, you'll see the true nature of a person. When hard, comes, when hard times comes their, uh, your way, whether it be cancer, financial struggles, whatever it is, where you go to in that moment, that's your comfort. That's your security. That's truly, in a real sense, your God. Church, where will we go when hard times come? Where will we go when difficulty comes? Where are we going to go? Where else would we go? But to God himself, you have the words of eternal life. Notice how Peter said that to Christ himself. You have the words of eternal life. You tell me what to do. You tell me where to go. You tell me how to live. You're the one who has it. And he goes on, verse 14 through 17. But as for you, again... As opposed to the imposters, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Yes, even the Old Testament tells us about Christ. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul is telling Timothy, those sacred scriptures that you were acquainted with, meaning the Old Testament, remember, the New Testament is still being written, it's still circulating at this time of this writing. So he's talking about that Old Testament that your grandmother and your mother gave you, as we saw earlier in this book. That Old Testament tells you about faith in Christ. Even what Rob read this morning. By faith, there's something greater. By faith, there's a a culmination. And Paul is telling Timothy, those sacred writings are able to do all things to make you complete, to grow you up into maturity. Church, is the Word of God bearing on all of life? Is the Word of God able to counsel the wise? Is the Word of God able to make the simple wise? Is the Word of God able to give us a foundation for education, for art, for politics, for the way we go to work, for the way that we raise our children? Is the Word of God suitable for education in our homes and education at the university level? Church, what do we really believe about the Word of God? Do we think it's just some type of, as they often say, Bible, basic instruction before leaving earth? Is that what we think of it? Is that really what we've minimized this word to? Or is the word of God that which does not fade? Verse 1. See what he says here. In chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, the, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. All that to say, we're in the presence of the Almighty. The presence of God, the presence of Christ, the presence of His kingdom, who's going to judge the living and the dead. Paul is telling Timothy, I'm charging you. This is something akin to a general that's about to die. He's looking at the next best guy in line. He says, I'm charging you. They're taking me out. They got a bounty on my head and it's it's about to come. My time of my departure is near, Timothy. I'm charging you. I'm commanding you. I'm, I'm literally moving you into a position to show this is before God Almighty. And what does he tell them? What does he tell them? Verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Again, as for you... Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Church, Paul's not messing around. Paul's not going to turn to this ministry and this Thursday night thing and this whatever. We so make everything about little groups that have to meet all the time. And okay, what are you? Okay, you are, okay, you're Mexican. You are, okay, you're 30 
and you're, uh, you just started a career? Okay, we need the Mexicans that are 30 and career group. That's what we think. Church, preach the word. If we preach this rightly and we preach this week in and week out and we preach this and we depend upon this church, we're going to be able to discern what's out there. We're going to be able to take what comes at us. We're going to be able to stand on the truth of the word of God if we listen to Paul and actually commit ourselves to the word preached. But I love how he ended that with complete patience and teaching. Don't become hasty. Don't begin to grow impatient with God's people. As you're giving it, as you're preaching it, remain patient in your teaching. Do not begin to lose control, as he said there at the end in verse 5. Don't lose your mind. Always be sober-minded. Fulfill your ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. Did you catch that? Now, does, is Paul telling Timothy to go hit the streets as an evangelist? That's how we think of it. Maybe there's some truth to that. But more so, Paul is telling Timothy, do the work of the evangelist. Do the work of the evangel. Keep the gospel about you at all times. Fulfilling the word, preaching the word, doing what the word was designed to do is never void of the gospel. It's always in light of the gospel. Otherwise, it just becomes duty without the light. Otherwise, it just comes works without having the assurance. We must see the work of Christ, the gospel of Christ, and how that impacts all of life. So when we read the word, we don't read it and say, okay, I got to do all these things to make my God happy. No, it's because my God is happy and what Christ has done for me. Now I can do these things joyfully. Now it's moving from a position of saying, okay, I have this burden upon me. I have this weight upon me. I got to make sure my God is appeased at all times. And I got I, I got it. I got it. I got it. And it's no rest, no happiness, no joy, always frustrated, always falling short. That's the wrong view. But Paul is telling Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Do the work of an evangelist, meaning do this work of preaching the word through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never separate those two things. Those two things are so tied together. You actually cannot actually preach the word rightly unless it's coming through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ, church. So this whole section is being summed up very simply for us. If you do not have the word, chaos. Capitalism, apart from the word, chaos. Western philosophy, apart from the word, chaos. Conservatism, apart from the word, chaos. Any good government, apart from the word, chaos. Every single time, chaos. Anything apart from the word is going to lead to some form of bondage over you, some form of slavery over you, some form of you having to do that to order in order to gratify something. But when you have the word as central through the gospel of Christ, then it's not chaos. Then it's actually God glorifying. This section is just summed up so simply it's either christ or chaos it's either fruitful teaching or fruitless teaching it's either false teachers or faithful teachers and i want us to really ask ourselves what do we want church what do you come here to get if you come here and there's no word and you leave happy you just thought you had a five course meal at costco sample section Church, if you come here and I don't give you the word, just leave. Do all of us a favor. Do me a favor and leave. Never sit under preaching that is not founded upon the word of God because now you're accumulating for yourself itchy ears. These churches are full. Maybe some of them because of ignorance. Maybe. But this is teaching that these false teachers are entertained because that's what the false listeners want. They go there because they give them what they want. Church, what do you want? What's going to be our standard? What are we going to commit to? What, what camp are we going to fall in? The camp that says the word of God is sufficient and it's clear. We want you to preach to us. Church, we need the word. Regardless of what's going on in the world, we need the word. And we need to show how the word is applied to everything. There's no stone turned over that that's not turned over from the word we had a men's breakfast we talked about intimacy because the word applies to that we want the word to seep into all of life church we need the word we need the gospel we need christ 
So I pray that as this young church is going to continue on, perhaps in perilous, difficult times in California, whatever may come, I pray that we would be a church that says, preach the word. Whoever steps in this pulpit, preach the word. Whatever happens outside of this pulpit in your daily lives may be founded upon the word. We need more spirit-filled preaching. And if you heard that, as a reformed individual, and you thought, is this guy turning charismatic? It's because you don't know what Puritan preaching is. We need spirit-empowered preacher, preaching, not academic lectures. I am sick and tired of hearing guys preach in reformed churches that sound like they're telling you something about a textbook church. We're talking about the Lord of glory. We're talking about Christ and Him crucified. Do we have... I mean, we have the right theology in Reformed churches. We have the right devotion when it comes to devotion to doctrine. We have the right mentality that theology is so vital, it undergirds everything. We have that, but where is the zeal? Where is the passion? Where are the men who are consumed by their high calling of saying that they've been entrusted to be the mouthpiece of God to declare forth the truth and not be satisfied to give their people anything else? Church, every week I leave here thinking, did I give them Christ? Did I preach the gospel to them? Did I give them the word or did I just give them my opinions, my weak opinions? No, church, we need preaching that is from the power of the Holy Spirit. We need preaching that has true anointing and unction from on high in those celestial places. Dare I say, church, we need a preacher who is anointed by the Spirit in the art of prophesying. And no, that's not charismania. That is pure biblical reformed Puritan preaching where we say, I'm not preaching. The Spirit's preaching through me. Church, what did you come here for? To receive the word, to receive Christ from his word, to receive the benefits and the blessings that have been offered to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you come here to see what God has to say about your life, about how you sustain a marriage, about how you raise a godly seed, about how you vote biblically, about how you do all things to the glory of God? Did you come here to learn what God believes and think God's thoughts after Him? Or did you come to receive some type of one-hour entertainment? Church, this is where we meet with God. It's not as you're cleaning and you heard some noise and was that you, God? Why would we do that when we got this? Church, in the worship of God, in the house of the Lord, when we come together, we have our triune God with us, delighting over us. And where His Word is, there Christ is. As His Word goes out, Christ is going out. And as His Word is going out, are you embracing Christ? Are you feasting upon Christ? Are you grabbing the Word and saying, Lord, plant Your Word down deep within me and give me Christ? A steady, consistent diet on the Word, I tell you, church, cannot leave you unchanged. If you have a lack of change in your life, What's your diet like? Now you can know. You can know what the best diet is. Ask Dewan, he'll tell you for 30 minutes what the best diet is. Okay? You can know it. But if you never implement that, you can know all about the details and this, that, or the other. You can know that up here. You can mentally ascend to that. You can know what the best diet is. But unless you begin to feast upon that diet, it does nothing for you. Church, you know what the best diet is. But are you feasting on it? You know where the truth is, but are you taking that in? Church, it begins with Christ. It labor, we labor with Christ to the end that we have Christ. I pray and I truly just want us as a church to be able to say, give us the word. Give us Christ from the word. Help us from the word. Let's pray. Let's pray for preaching. On your way to church, pray for the preacher. Let's be, in a sense, thankful that we are a church that up until now, and Lord willing for generations to come, have sought to make this pulpit a Bible-based pulpit. You know how many sheep are being starved by their pastors out there? You know how many do not have access to someone who has a higher regard to the Word of God? 
Pray for your word. Pray for the preacher at your church. Feast upon Christ from the word. Live every detail of your life from the word and be thankful and never take the fact that you have access to the word of God in your own language. You are part of a local church who esteems the word of God. And if you need counsel, it's going to be from the word. If you need help, it's going to be from the word. If you need encouragement, it better be from the word. Whatever it is, I pray, church, that we came here to find the word as it reveals Jesus Christ himself by the power of the spirit. I pray we came here for that. And I pray that we leave with that week in and week out. Pray for this church. May we never take this for granted. May we never presume upon this. Pray for us. Pray that our church would always, no matter what comes, would get stuck in with this. Let's pray. Lord, it's so clearly laid out, apart from Christ and His Word, Chaos ensues. Lord, may we always feast upon Christ in this place, in this church. May we never be happy or content with anything apart from Christ and His Word. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have